Good morning, CCD. Our reading today is from James, chapter 2, and I'm reading from the New Living Translation. My dear brothers and sisters, how can you claim to have faith in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ if you favor some people over others? For example, suppose someone comes in to your meeting dressed in fancy clothes and expensive jewelry, and another comes in who is poor and dressed in dirty clothes. If you give special attention and a good seat to the rich person, but you say to the poor one, you can stand over there or else sit on the floor. Well, doesn't this discrimination show that your just judgment are guided by evil motives? Listen to me, dear brothers and sisters. Hasn't God chosen the poor in this world to be rich in faith? Aren't they the ones who will inherit the kingdom he promised to those who love him? But you dishonored the poor. Isn't it the, isn't it the rich who oppress you and drag you into court? Aren't they the ones who slander Jesus Christ, whose noble name you bear? Yes, indeed. It is good when you obey the royal law as found in the scriptures. Love your neighbor as yourself. But if you favor some people over others, you are committing a sin. You are guilty of breaking the law. For the person who keeps all the laws except one is as guilty as a person who has broken all of God's laws. For the same God who said, you must not commit adultery, also said, you must not murder. So if you murder someone, but do not commit adultery, you have still broken the law. So whatever you say or whatever you do, remember that you will be judged by the law that sets you free. There will be no mercy for those who have not shown mercy to others. But if you have been merciful, God will be merciful when he judges you. What good is it, dear brothers and sisters, if you say you have faith, but don't show it by your actions? Can that kind of faith save anyone? Suppose you see your brother or sister who has no food or clothing and you say, goodbye and have a good day, stay warm and eat well, but then you don't give that person any food or clothing. What good does that do? So you see, faith by itself isn't enough. Unless it produces good deeds, it is dead and useless. Now someone may argue, some people have faith, others have good deeds, but I say, how can you show me your faith if you don't have good deeds? I will show you my faith by my good deeds. You say you have faith for you believe that there is one God? Good for you. Even the demons believe this and they tremble in terror. How foolish. Can't you see that faith without good deeds is useless? Don't you remember that our ancestor Abraham has shown to be right with God by his actions when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? You see, his faith and his actions worked together. His actions made his faith complete. And so it happened just as the scriptures say. Abraham believed God and God counted him as righteous because of his faith. He, has give, he has even called the, was even called the friend of God. So you see, we are shown to be right with God by what we do, not by faith alone. Rahab the prostitute is another example. She was shown to be right with God by her actions when she hit those messengers and sent them safely away by a different route, road. Just as the body is dead without breath, so also faith is dead without good works. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Good morning, church. I'm just going to put this aside. As soon as the pastor said, um, are we doing chapter 2 or chapter 3? I'm thinking, oh no, it's chapter 3. I've got to run home and get my other sermon notes. <laughs> That's a joke, by the way. <laughs> so I'm just going to take this off because I'm already too hot. I'm well insulated, can you tell? <laughs> Praise the Lord. Let us, let us pray. 
And just tell me, brother, if I need to move this mic around. Okay. Father, as we come before you this morning, Lord, Lord, we thank you, Lord, for the, the work that you've done in and through our hearts and our lives. Lord, we simply ask that we be open to all that you desire to speak to us. For it is by your spirit that there is change. It is by your spirit that there is revelation. And it's in, in and through your word and by your grace that we grow and become the people of God into your image. And without you, Lord, we can do nothing. So, Father, I thank you for all that you're going to do in advance. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. So I'm going to, I'm going to share a little bit of my testimony again. I'm thinking, how, many, how often can this guy share his testimony? Um, slightly differently this morning. Now, I, I was, I don't know if anybody knows here, but I was a first-generation migrant. And all my thinking and understanding was filtered through the lens of being Yugoslavian. Now, I had to learn to fit into this Canadian culture that I was born into as I tried to walk into two different worlds. Then, when I came to Australia, I needed to learn to fit in again into the Aussie culture. Yet, because of my accent, everybody kind of automatically created an image of who I am. And at times, I didn't get jobs or at times uh, I was kind of judged for my accent. But that's not just in my travels here. That was actually growing up in Canada. I remember when I was 13 years old, uh, because being Yugoslavian, my first language at home was, was Slovenian, which is dialect of Yugoslavian in those days. There's no, much, no more Yugoslavia. And um, so I was working uh, in a, check, a checkout um, a cash register and uh, with a normal Canadian accent. Um, uh, these two uh, elderly ladies walked through and they started to talk about me, but they were talking about me in Yugoslavian, not realizing that I was Yugoslavian. And I sat there and uh, they had some interesting things to say. And um, so when I, when I got their change, I counted it back to them in Yugoslavian. And their eyes were like, you're not, you're, uh, yeah, yes, I am. <laughs> Yes, I am. So over the years, I've been called many different things uh, because of I thought differently. From one culture, I was either too aggressive or too possessive or dominating. From another culture, I was too soft and too gentle. I, I know, I know. Now, I felt the sting and rejection of being a migrant due to the nationalistic pride that I encountered. But, but... I was blinded to my own nationalistic pride. I was proud of being European. I came to this country and never once thought that I was Canadian. Go figure. And um, you're probably going, how does that work? But I, I never grew up thinking I was Canadian. It was very much, you're Yugoslavia, you're proud of being Slavic, and this is who you are, and this is... And so when I was here, the Lord had to show me the log in my own eye and I had to also repent of my own nationalistic pride. Now, over the last 25 years, the Lord moved me from church to church to church to fulfill his plan and purpose in my life, and much to my resistance at times. And every church that the Lord brought me into, I had to learn again what was acceptable and what was not acceptable in order for me to fit in to that church culture. Now, I'm not talking about biblically speaking either. Every church had its own unique form of liturgy. What was acceptable practice and behaviors from prayer straight through to how you dressed. Now, because the Lord moved me from church to church, I experienced so many wonderful things from each denomination. Yet I also experienced their individual denominational pride. And I was disturbed at times when leaders would slander and judge one another, and it was done over the pulpit. Because what was happening in another denomination wasn't acceptable in their denomination. Church against church, denomination against denomination, divided and for the world to see. And we wonder why at times there is no anointing or power in the church anymore. At times we have simply become a spectacle 
to the world as the blind leading the blind due to the logs in our own eyes. Let me ask you a personal question. Have you ever felt misunderstood or judged for your skin color, your, national, your nationality, maybe your disability, a speech impediment, a disfigurement, an accent, your cultural upbringing, maybe your ways of thinking, or even your denominational background? Or have you done it to others? All of us, all of us have to deal with the never-ending changes in the world of what is acceptable and what is not acceptable. And unless we fit into the world's views, we are judged and ostracized, left out on the outer. In the church, though, this should not be the case. Partiality is one of the greatest tragedies in the house of God. And I've entitled this message, Practicing the Truth. And today we're going to continue our lessons on the epistle of James in chapter 2. And over the last few weeks, we went through uh, chapter 1 and we talked about trials and we talked about temptation. Today I'd like to continue our journey in spiritual maturity and I want to look more closely at partiality and practical faith as James addresses this in chapter 2. Now, <clears throat> there is a simple foundational truth that we all need to understand. The way we behave towards people is a thermometer of what we really believe about God. We actually can't separate one from the other. <clears throat> and James deals with this partiality in a very straightforward, practical manner. And you can see this as you read through James chapter 1, sorry, James chapter 2, verses 1 to 3. Now, when we look into this and we look a little bit about the history and the background, there are stories that as James was writing this letter to those scattered abroad, that churches were a blend between those who were wealthy and those who were poor. Now, to be a Christian in, in that day and age, you know, there was, there was many gods within the workplaces. And at times, because of that, and they would refuse to bow down to them, they were ostracized and left out, or even to the point where they were completely and utterly unemployed. The interesting thing was slavery was actually a normal practice in those days. Imagine that. A slave gets saved, and now he was teaching or pastoring. And his owner was a member of the church who he was a pastor of. Now that would present some interesting interpersonal difficulties, wouldn't it? Now, we don't really have any specific details here, but James actually addresses quite a large portion of chapter 2 to practical Christian living, and he uses the example of poor across the entire chapter. And after that example, the Bible says these words in verses 4, Have you not shown partiality amongst yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Evil thoughts. Why, why is it evil thinking? Because it goes against biblical thinking. We actually misrepresent who God is. It's what the Bible refers to as unjust scales. Judging something based on our own opinions, contrary to the scripture. So, really quickly, what is the difference between biblical and unbiblical thinking? Well, James graciously gives us a very clear example of that in chapter 3, verses 14, the Bible says. But if you have bitter envy and self-seeking in your hearts. Do not boast and lie against the truth. This wisdom that does not ascend from above, but is earthly, sensual, and demonic. For where envy and self-seeking exist, confusion and every evil thing are there. So he gives us a, an example of unbiblical, sensual, and demonic thinking. Now James also explains in the very next verse what biblical thinking is. In verses 17, the Bible says, The wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. Now the fruit of the righteous is sown in peace by those who make peace. Now this church was judging its members and visitors with a worldly judgment, not actually seeing visitors through the eyes of Christ. They were judging by outward appearance. Now as men, 
or mankind in general, we're, we're really impressed with things like titles and position. Jesus, though, he said that those who desire to be the greatest are servants of all. Partiality misrepresents Jesus Christ. Why? Because Jesus is impartial. Verses 8, the Bible says, If you really fulfill the royal law according to the scriptures, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, you do well. But if you show partiality, you commit sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. Now, I actually can't add any more to that portion of scripture. The Bible is very clear. Partiality is sin. Every time you and I show partiality, we commit sin. Why? Why is it considered sin? Well, firstly, it sets divisions. Divisions and factions within the house of God. Making some better than others. And Paul had to personally deal with this in the church, specifically with Peter. Now, now listen to this in Galatians chapter 2, starting at verses 11. I'm going to read a portion of it, and then I'm going to paraphrase myself some of it, so because it's quite a large portion. And the Bible says, now when Peter had come to Antioch, I, being Paul, withstood him to his face because he was to be blamed. For before certain men came from James, he would eat with the Gentiles. But when they came, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing those who were of the circumcision. And the rest of the Jews also played the hypocrite with him, so that even Barnabas was carried away with their hypocrisy. But, I, but when I saw, this is Paul, that they were not straightforward about the truth of the gospel, I said to Peter before them all, now I'm going to paraphrase this. Peter, listen, you're a, you're a Jew and you live like the Gentiles. And then you make it necessary for Gentiles to live like Jews, knowing full well that none of us is justified by the works of the law, but only by faith in Jesus Christ. That's, that's, that's full on. If righteousness comes through the law, then Christ died in vain. That, that's just straightforward. Due to Peter's partiality and hypocrisy, he became, as James said, a judge with evil thoughts. Unjust scales. To the point he led others astray into his hypocrisy, including Barnabas who we know is the son of encouragement. And that is the danger of this evil seed. It spreads like a weed. Partiality breeds and reproduces partiality. Bigotry breeds and reproduces bigotry. An evil seed that gets planted from generation to generation, father to son, mother to daughter, pastor to disciple. Let me peel back the shell of the seed. So we can clearly see what it truly is. Partiality is actually at its core the pride of life. Now it's covered in different fruit due to our own experiences and upbringings. For some it may be the fruit of bigotry or hurt, hatred, intolerance, or snobbery. And it actually can come in many, many different disguises. Sometimes it's disguised as biblical purity, structure, position, and tradition. And we all fall in it from time to time, as we paint entire cultures with words of partiality, and we do it out of our mouth in joking and jest, and then we simply brush it aside like we never did it. Let me give you a modern example that maybe some of us, if not all of us, would have potentially fallen into. Oh, man, did you see that person? Did you see how they were driving? Can you believe that? They must have been... The, the, the words just enter your mind who you thought they must have been. Or, t did you hear that? That's so typical of fill in the blanks. Or can you believe what's happening? They're all the same. We all fall into this dangerous and subtle trap. None of us is excused from this. None of us. But in the church, if left unchecked, it breeds and reproduces exclusivity, segregation, and an air of superiority. And we're blinded to the fact that it can be so ingrained within us that like Peter, we lead 
others astray because of what's in our own partiality. Now, Peter learned many lessons, and I really thank God for Peter. I, I relate to Peter so much. We always refer to him as, uh, he, you know, he had foot and mouth disease or sandal and mouth disease. I, I relate to that. Listen to what Peter says to give us insight into who we are. 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 4, the Bible says, Coming to Jesus as to a living stone, rejected indeed by men, but chosen by God and precious for you as living stones are being built up, a spiritual house, a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. And then verses 9, but you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, who were not a people, but are now the people of God, who have not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. Individually, we are living stones put together, making up the church and the family of God. We are servants of one master, and that is Jesus Christ. And before we got saved, whether you were a prostitute, whether you were a beggar, whether you were a murderer, whether you were a thief, or whether or not you were a billionaire, you were all on equal footing before Jesus Christ, sinners in the need of a Savior. And when we get saved, we are still on equal footing before the Lord, servants to the king. His blood shed equally for all mankind, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish, be set free, and become a citizen of heaven. Church, the very thing that we have in common, and the only thing that we should be building our relationships on, is the fact that we have the same father, and been washed by the same blood of the same spotless lamb. We who were once unsaved, receive mercy from Jesus Christ, and are now considered the family of God. There is no one greater, no family member greater than the other. Yes, we have different roles. Yes, we have different responsibilities in operating in different functions, but no job is small and insignificant. We need to understand this simple truth that we are part of the same family. In our eyes, we need to be open to the strategy of the devil here and how he uses partiality. His desire is to divide and conquer, to keep us separate so we don't pray for one another and encourage one another in the faith. He so sees a distrust, discouragement, and he spreads lies through gossip and slander so we never come to the place where we truly trust one another. Why? So that the church never comes to the point where we realize that to be saved and added to the kingdom is being added to the family of God. And Satan knows that a house divided against itself, it won't stand. It has no authority. It has no power. It has no testimony. You know, many of us may have grown up in dysfunctional families. We may have, we may not. I don't know. So, sometimes we don't know how to behave in a biblical family. And James actually helps us here. He starts by saying in verses 8, you do well if you love your neighbor as yourself. That's a good starting point. Treat others exactly as you would like to be treated in word and in deed. The family of God is a melting pot of cultures, of nationalities, of traditions. The one nationality that governs them all, though, and the one citizenship that governs them all is our heavenly one. When we become Christians, there is a new cultural belief, a new language, a new way to behave, a new way to serve, a new standard a completely brand new life. And Jesus asks us to die to ourself and follow him. So then, some of, you, some of you here might be asking, well, what about the difficult people? There's no difficult people, you know. 
What about the difficult people? The difficult brothers and sisters. I, I honestly sincerely believe that we're all difficult in some area of our life. Some may not believe that, but I, I believe that. Now, one of the early church bishops compared the church to Noah's Ark. He actually said, if it wasn't for the storm on the outside, we wouldn't be able to stand the stench on the inside. Every single member in the body of Christ has an area in their, body, area in their life that kind of stinks a bit. Just a little. A bit smelly at times. We are all uniquely, uniquely and wonderfully made. And we're all at different parts within the journey with our walks within the Lord. We need to be patient with one another and love one another and never forget that Jesus Christ, what he did on Calvary's cross is all that binds us together. Amen? I want to move on and talk about practical faith. Now, over the years, I've heard this statement that they are so heavenly minded that they're no earthly good. I've heard that for almost 20 years. Everybody else, has anybody else heard that statement? Yeah? Okay. Now, I want to reject it openly and on camera. <laughs> I want to reject that statement. I believe that's actually a mockery and contrary to the character of God. I believe it should actually say the more spiritually minded one becomes, the more biblically and practically based their life becomes. Now, James, in our portion of Scripture, uses the example of clothing and feeding a poor man to illustrate how he's going to show his faith by his works. And I like to modernize that a bit. And I want to talk about submission and service. Those are almost classified nowadays as the two swear words in Christianity. Put your hands over yours. No, submission, service, no, 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 no. Now, Christians today who refuse the biblical precept, precept of submission, they're, they're actually not being biblically minded. They're actually being worldly minded. Now, they're exercising their democratic rights. The freedom of choice, freedom of expression. Yet, as much as we are free in Christ, the Bible actually time and again sets order and structure in place. It challenges us and says to submit one to another. Submit to governing authority. Wives, submit to husbands as unto the Lord. To name but a few examples in Scripture. And it says we're all to die to ourselves and follow Christ. Now, we cannot say we are in submission to God unless we have humbled ourselves and implemented in our lives his biblical precept of submission. And I want to challenge everybody here today who hear this message to study the scriptures regarding submission. Jesus, now, he could have, while he was on the cross, he could have called down all of heaven and literally wiped out all of mankind. Yet he didn't. He was submitted unto his Father, unto death. Now, the church this day and age is in disarray because it doesn't understand the foundational principles of submission. And it goes to extremes, either to the left where there is structure, hierarchy, or heavy shepherding on one side, or complete charismatic chaos on the other side where anything goes. Yet God is a God of order. And everything, everything, including the offices, callings, and giftings of the Holy Spirit have been set in place within the church for structure, for order, to equip and to edify. And the more that we grow in the power of God's Spirit and the knowledge of His Word and of our Heavenly Father, the more submissive and sensitive we actually become to His perfect order. Now, when the Lord moved me on from the Pentecostal church to the Baptist church to the Anglican church, it, it was never my will. It was never my desire. I didn't kind of strategize it and plan it. God knows this. But due to my stubborn resistance along the way, I learned everything the hard way. And when I did things according to my own will, everything fell apart. Absolutely everything. My life lost the blessings and favor and sensitivity of God's Holy Spirit because my will was in direct opposition to the Father's will. Our natural man, by default, is rebellious. It's unsubmissive. Now listen, all of us here can quote Romans 8, 28, right? All things work together for good to those that love the Lord. Amen? We can all quote that. So what is the practical expression then of loving the Lord? 
Jesus said in John 14, 15, if you love me, you keep my commandments. Oh, come on, Taylor. Really? That's kind of a bit one-sided. There's other things that we do in the spirits and the giftings of God. You know, there's so much we do. What about them? I encourage you to read Matthew 7, verses 22 to 23. Jesus said, many will come to me in that day saying, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name? Have we not cast out demons in your name? And so on. And then he said, depart from me. I never knew you. Those who practice lawlessness. Those who did not keep my commands. We will never grow in spiritual maturity. We will never step into God's plan and purpose for our lives unless we learn, implement, and abide in this biblical principle of submission. And that brings me to my closing point, acts of service. Now, all of us know this story. If we read Acts chapter 6, we can read that the church was growing just fast, so quickly in the book of Acts. And it got to the stage where things were starting to fall apart slightly, and things were getting left undone, and the apostles, they couldn't do anything or everything, and all of a sudden, the Hellenists, which were the Greeks in those days, were starting to complain because, you know, the, the, the widows were actually not a part of their daily distribution. So the apostles got together, and they thought, well, well listen, we need to choose seven men full of good reputation, full of the Holy Spirit, full of wisdom. These men had so much faith, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom. And what did they do? They served tables. Oh, how do we know they had so much faith? Well, Stephen was the first martyr in the church. And Philip, who's the other one? He was the first evangelist in the church powerfully used by God, and they practically express their faith by serving tables. You may say, listen, God has given me the gift of healing, and he's given me prophecy, and he's given me interpretation and wisdom, and so much knowledge in Scripture, and I'm going to be the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Praise God. Let his name be glorified in and through your life. I think that's wonderful. So based on that, how do we practically apply all that the Lord is doing in and through our lives? in the church that he's called us to. Jesus said, those who desire to be the greatest are the servants of all. And when we have so much power and authority in the Holy Spirit, we are a servant. This is the greatest need in the church right now. Men and women who would stand for God, be accountable, be teachable, have open hearts and serve others. As spiritually equipped men and women of God by faith, when you see the need, you meet the need. And when you're doing that, you're imitating Jesus Christ, who did not come into the world to, to be served, but to serve. And as you're faithful in serving, God will open up more do doors for you to serve. Acts of service is the greatest, greatest language, love language of the church. The greatest love language. We find it sometimes so easy when we're doing things outside of the church by giving our time, our energy, our finances, which is good. There's nothing wrong with that. But then on the other hand, we don't serve in our own church family, sharing on the work and making the burden light for one another. And there's many churches, there's many churches that are struggling here and left in tatters and complete disarray because of this very thing. And unfortunately, like partiality, the pride of life also manifests itself in a believer's heart and says, I will only smur smurp, I will only serve and submit on my terms. That actually stems from self-will and rebellion. And the Bible says in John 14, this new commandment I give unto you, that you love one another as I have loved you, then the world will know you are my disciples. How did Jesus love? He served them unto death. He served you and I unto death. And if we say we believe, then we act accordingly. Unless we're practicing what we preach, we are simply dead religion. Words without power, clouds without rain, a church without true biblical expression, people who talk the talk but never ever walk the walk. 
uh, something that Pastor Richard said about a month ago that just stuck with me, had been playing in my head. And he said, church is not a social club. And that just was like, yeah, it's not. It's not a social club. It's not done on our terms. It's a family. And when a family serves together, only then can it be an effective hospital to a lost and dying world. If we have faith and we believe that God is in control and we join a church where we believe God has placed us, then we need to humble ourselves, submit to God and serve. Church, it's all about people. Partiality undermines everything Christ died for. Everything. Partiality is sin. But faith is practical. Can I have every head bowed and every eye closed? In respect to all those around you, in respect to the Lord.